Now, in this video, I want to look back a little bit. I want to notice how the way that we talk about seeing, our understanding of our own visual prowess, has been greatly altered by technological and media developments over the last several hundred years. Now, when I teach my students what we're at in cognitive science, I like to point out that we're striving to understand ourselves, whatever we are, and that if that sense of we extends to people from other cultures or people who are not entirely products of scientific modernity, a certain degree of caution is needed. I use the following historical timeline with very coarse dates. Around 1600, we have the birth of scientific modernity. Around 1850, we have the death of God, that is, you cannot appeal to God in public discourse, whereas prior to that you had to. And we have the news from Charles Darwin that we are organisms, a fact we still don't know what to do with. So if God dies in 1850, man dies in 1945, after the cataclysms of the First and Second World War and the Holocaust, the atomic bomb, any vision of man as a semi-divine being is not available anymore. That. And we do our work in the present context. When we try to understand visual perception now, I've suggested that it would be wise for us to maintain some small degree of credibility by coming up with stories that allow us to see ourselves as continuous with other beasts, not only pre-modern humans or culturally distant humans, but actually animals as well. So if the way we talk about seeing, the supports for seeing, and so on, are actually recent cultural developments, it would be unwise to look for mechanisms in the eye or the brain um, here. Now, I've done another video about the emergence of linear perspective, which happened in the 15th century. That is just prior to the advent of scientific modernity. And linear perspective provides a representation of space, much like this, with a single vanishing point. In, this, in such a space, you have determinate coordinates. You, can, you know where you are, as it were. You can be indexed. And this has become very much part of our everyday life. I've made a whole video on the muller lyer illusion and the effect of vertical walls, horizontal ceilings and floors, right angles, and the degree to which they have hugely influenced our vision. Linear perspective underlies the logic of the photograph as well. We've met the static monocular viewing point before here. And we'll come to mirrors in a, and maybe even mobile phones in a later video. But today, I want to address two other innovations around the time of scientific modernity, which greatly altered our understanding of space, our position in the cosmos as we see it, and how we think and talk about seeing. I'm referring specifically to the development of the telescope and the microscope both in the early 17th century, about 1608 for the telescope, about 1620 for the microscope. And by here I mean a compound microscope, something with two lenses, and a telescope likewise with two lenses, such that we're talking here about tubes. And it's the tubular nature of these things that I want to address. When people started looking through tubes at the cosmos and seeing things like the moons of Jupiter, what an exciting time to be alive. Suddenly, you have a direct intuition or a direct apprehension of vast amounts of space that was not available to a ground-based observer before. So a different realm comes into being. Likewise, and not coincidentally at the same time, a microcosm opens up and we get access to a world that we could not possibly physically inhabit ourselves. We see it again through tubes. Now, what do tubes have to do with this? Well, if you take a regular tube, here's an old toilet roll, and you peer through it, 
it should become quickly apparent to you that so your vision is radically altered. There is now a distinguished visual field. There actually is a visual field here. We've noted that in general and wild seeing there is not. And there's a strict separation of subject and object. You can wiggle your bum and do a little dance, and as long as you keep your eye glued to the eyepiece, the thing you're looking at doesn't change. This is a radical innovation in vision. It allows us to see things which are not of our world. It allows a, us to believe that we are seeing a transcendent realm. And of course, this hugely affected our imagination. We come to understand our local representation of space as being continuous with the space of the planets, the stars, the galaxies, and the space of the amoebas and paramecium's. This is a radical innovation that separates the world of the viewer from the world that's viewed. Around the same time, shortly before, picture frames start to emerge. Now these are so common that we might easily forget that most people at most times have never seen a picture in a frame. We are very comfortable with viewing pictures in frames. But in fact, pictures in frames of the sort we see here emerged in a particular context. After the Protestant Reformation, there was a wave of iconoclasm that spread through Northern Europe, one of many waves of iconoclasm that pop up from time to time. But an iconic or image-hating Puritans went around destroying the images in the churches in the Netherlands and Belgium, the current Low Countries. It was around this time that pictures were then saved. They, uh, prior to this, the places you would see pictures and frames is only in the church. They were not generally accessible. They belonged in the church. They were part of the church. They were part of the experience of visiting a church. But now they had to be saved. And from those actions, we get the idea of an art gallery. That is a place in which pictures are hung on walls and you go along and look at the pictures. Well, what does a frame do? It affects a very peculiar kind of magic. Everything inside the frame belongs to a different realm than you do. Once more we have this idea that we are granted access to a transcendent realm. Now, of course, picture frames are part and parcel of the logic of the construction of images that represent space. And you don't need a big wooden frame in order to employ that logic. A f mere photograph is enough. And we have become image-saturated beings. We are inundated with pictures in frames, each frame providing access to a transcendental realm. Photography has now moved, of course, largely to screens. And on the screens, we have images within images within images within images. This is a relatively new condition for any creature to find itself in, and any account of seeing that fails to notice the effect of both tubes and frames on us will be inadequate, for it will take as part of the natural world something that actually belongs to our cultural practices and technological developments. Let's just consider the experience of someone in the Sistine Chapel. When you walk into the Sistine Chapel, it's an overwhelming experience. There's art everywhere. You're looking up to the heavens. There are figures everywhere. There's not a frame in sight. Everything overspills everything. And you can move around as an observer inside the Sistine Chapel. You can lie on the floor and look at the ceiling if there's not too many tourists around. You can move around and you are inside as it were, what you're looking at. Contrast that, if you will, with the latest fetish of virtual reality, which tries to give you a sense of a completely wraparound projection, but reduces the viewer to a virtual point in space. The separation of image and of this, the thing seen and the seer is now complete. So tubes and frames have hugely altered how we see, how we think about seeing, how we think about transcendence, and the relationship of the viewing subject to that which is seen. This is rarely recognized. In the next video we'll go on to consider the face and the mirror.